Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The conflict in Libya between two competing forces assisted by regional and global actors has seemingly reached a deadlock. Neither the government headed by Fayez al-Saraj nor the militia commanded by Khalifa Haftar can defeat each other and the costs in civilian casualties and infrastructure destruction keeps rising. Is there a solution in the horizon, perhaps brokered by Western powers or Eastern powers, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates? To analyze the situation in Libya, we're joined from a location in central Israel by Dr. Chaim Cohen, who is the former Israeli ambassador to Egypt and a lecturer at IDC Herzliya. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I would like also to welcome to our panel from another community in central Israel, Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at Shalem College. Welcome. Thank you, John. And here with me in the studio is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren. Welcome. I'd like immediately to delve also uh, into this uh, topic. Give us a, a broader understanding of the current situation in Libya. Obviously, this country has a lot of impact on the situation in the Middle East, not only for that country, but uh, also for Israel. So it's uh, very fortunate that Ambassador Karen is here because it gives me an opportunity to mention that after uh, many years, decades, where uh, Egypt uh, was uh, part of the Near East Affairs uh, Bureau along with Israel and part of the Arab-Israeli conflict, it has recently been moved to the Maghreb and Egypt uh, sub-bureau because of uh, the peaceful relations with Israel and because the focus has shifted uh, towards Libya. Now, just to refresh uh, everyone's memory, uh, Libya is a desert country. One may say that it's a desert container with the top along the Mediterranean, a coastal society. But most of the country, 90% or more uh, of the country is desert. Uh, it's uh, not uh, the best place uh, in the world uh, to try and make a living in. Has very long borders with Egypt, with Algeria, uh, with uh, Chad. Um, sure? And um, much like Iraq after Saddam Hussein, uh, Libya after Gaddafi, both Saddam and Gaddafi have been anathema to the world, but once they were gone, uh, the countries uh, have fell into civil conflicts. And the one that you mentioned, which is still ongoing, is between Saraj as the head of the government of National Accord, which uh, has been recognized by the United Nations as well as by the United States, and the um, um, army uh, headed by uh, the uh, self-described no. uh, Marshal Haftar, no. uh, who is uh, backed by the UAE, uh, by uh, Egypt, um, and by uh, Russia. Now, uh, what we have here is uh, the uh, eastern part of uh, uh, Libya, uh, around Benghazi, uh, uh, held by Haftar, who is now attacking Tripoli. He's trying to take over the western part, where uh, Saraj is holding firm. And apparently, uh, what is happening is uh, the first uh, air-to-air drone war in the, in the Middle East, because while they have some air forces or, or fighters and pilots, most of the attacks and the surveillance from the air is being conducted by drones on either side. Um, and we have a deadlock. Um, right now, Haftar is probably more amenable to a ceasefire than he was earlier. There have been many efforts at getting a ceasefire first and then some sort of national reconciliation. But we have the United States with Haftar and we have the uh, Wagner private company mercenaries uh, sent by Russia along with Syrian mercenaries helping uh, Haftar. Indeed. Well, uh, I'd like to refer the next question to you, Dr. Koren, as you have been studying the Libya issue for quite some time now, also from an Egyptian perspective, from an African perspective to this uh, uh, country, and of course, from an Israeli perspective as an Israeli former diplomat. To what degree do you see this uh, current situation in true deep deadlock where there is no true light at the end of the horizon. Major countries have already tried to intervene uh, with n very little success in bringing about any change. The attempt to, to solve the situation in uh, 
Libya will take some time. It's not easy. There are three main elements. One, the domestic one within Libya, which is actually a failed state. Uh, regionally, which actually makes uh, Egypt busy with that. With, uh, uh, um, uh, Chad and immediate neighbors of uh, Libya, which suffering from uh, non-state actors penetrating back and forth uh, for many uh, 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 regions within uh, Libya and outside. And the third one is a global one, which actually keep make most of, of the countries in, in uh, EU and US and in our region very busy. Now, uh, the fact that Turkey and uh, uh, is heavily involved recently in the last year within Libya for its own interest, while Russia and Egypt supporting strong and, and, and the Emirates supporting strongly Haftar makes the situation really uh, kind of an enigma to solve. When we thinking about the consequences like immigration and the whole process about it from Libya to Europe and preventing it, the, the uh, uh, fight on the uh, energy uh, 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 um, uh, economy uh, and the and the uh, Turkey's uh, attempt to come together with Libya in order to promote Turkish uh, interest in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, it becomes extremely uh, dangerous, and uh, the traditional. Uh, states that used to be in Libya, like Italy and some others, uh, cannot do much now, uh, not talking about the UN, they're trying for a long time to find a, a way to do it, but until now, not very successful. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Lerman, I would like to ask you about the European perspective of this current situation. Of course, the Middle East is always interconnected. Uh, the situation in Syria is interconnected with the situation in Libya. And uh, with the situation between Turkey and Egypt, of course, with the gas pipeline, with the global power interest, and it, we can go on and on and on and on and until uh, we can never really find the <laughs> end of this line pertaining to how broad this uh, subject can be. But I'd like to focus on the fact that there is an interconnection between the Italian interests that are presented also in Libya, as well as the French one, as opposed to the Turkish one, not to forget the uh, famous Atatürk, who became later the president of uh, Turkey and uh, was hailed as the person who revolutionized and modernized that country, uh, was actually, be uh, he became famous at the beginning as a commander of the Turkish forces against an Italian invasion. Mm -hmm. And there were different aspects to that. 19, 1911. Correct. 1911, just before uh, World War One. To what degree is the historic interest of uh, the respective countries in question still at play today? Well, it's certainly part of what makes Libya matter to Italy. But uh, you don't need to look uh, to history. Uh, you also have geography. It's obvious that uh, given Italy's vulnerability when it comes to the refugee question, the whole, the, which has become, of course, central to the Italian political debate with Salvini and others, uh, carrying the, the argument forward, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of Europe, Italy does not want to be at the receiving end of a, of a demo, demographic catastrophe. So Libya becomes, and what happens in Libya becomes very important for the Italians. But by now, and, and of course, there was also a question of prestige. And uh, if you look at the efforts last year to mediate between Haftar and, uh, and the Sarraj government, you see that the Italian government and the French government were competing with each other, trying to do roughly the same thing at the same time, but uh, tripping each other up uh, for reasons essentially of, of, uh, of prestige and of, uh, of tradition. But now there is an added element which has shifted the entire center of gravity in the European uh, re uh, response to the Libyan crisis. Uh, with the um, declaration or the, uh, of, of an agreement between uh, that, that uh, Dr. Koren has mentioned, Basel Koren has mentioned, the um, agreement between Ankara and, and Libya or 
to be precise, between Erdogan and the Saraj government in Tripoli over the delineation of the EEZ in eastern in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Turkey is deliberately trying to drive a wedge through the EMGF countries, Italy and Greece on one side, Egypt, Israel and Cyprus and Jordan for that matter on the other. So that becomes uh, now an, an issue, issue Libya, Libya or uh, who, who dominates, dominates Libya? Libya? Is Saraj in a position to carry forward the implementation of this uh, Turkish map of the Eastern Mediterranean? That becomes a European question as well as an Israeli question. Indeed. And you see, th you see this translated into the decision by Europe, a, a very unusual um, act to actually implement military measures to impose the arms embargo. Now, we all understand that this is relevant only to naval shipment, to maritime shipments to the Saraj government, because Haftar can be supplied over the Egyptian border. That is something that Europe has no capacity to interfere with. So this is essentially directed at the Turkish. Which upgraded, Turkish basically, role. it upgraded the previous operation, Sophia, which uh, aimed at uh, thwarting uh, human trafficking and migration Indeed. and so on, into a new operation that really uh, seems to blockade Libya and the Saraj government from receiving both uh, Islamist jihadists uh, that have been backed by Turkey and Syria, which uh, Ankara tried to divert to into Libya and attack uh, the Haftar government by means of supporting the Saraj government. Now, I'd like to refer the next I'll question. I'll just say it, Islamist and Turkmen militias. Indeed. Both of which Indeed. have ended up uh, fighting on Saraj's side. Correct. Uh, Mr. Oren, the situation in Libya is quite uh, fascinating to a certain degree, very sad on another. But when we really look at the situation, the only reason the Saraj government is so-called internationally recognized is because of the uh, a government of na uh, national reconciliation or agreement, accord, uh, however they might call it. The United Nations established after a lot of negotiations this uh, uh, somewhat of an administration that is not backed by the majority of Libya, which is a tribal country. A lot of different tribes that back one leader as opposed to the other. Haftal seems to have the major support when we're talking about that specific country. But as uh, Dr. Uh, Lerman has mentioned, as well as Dr. Koren, uh, he is speaking about the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone, pact between Saraj and Erdogan that basically curved up the Mediterranean into two and established a certain blockade. If the Saraj government survives, it means that Israel is blockaded, Egypt is blockaded, and the East and the West need to go through, e uh, sorry, through uh, Turkey in order to make any kind of movement. So that was the reason uh, why uh, some uh, 35 years ago, the Reagan administration uh, battled Gaddafi um, in Operation El Dorado Canyon. Um, as uh, Dr. Lemon mentioned, uh, geography is all important. And uh, when you go uh, through the Gibraltar Straits and uh, head east, you must go either uh, next to the Gulf of Sidra, which is um, uh, adjacent uh, to uh, three parts of the uh, Libyan uh, coastline, or around Malta, Crete, and other uh, Greek islands. Uh, and the Sixth Fleet is supposed to be there uh, in the Mediterranean until President Trump decides to redeploy it out of the Mediterranean and back home uh, for exactly that reason. And in order for the uh, Russian fleet not to take over uh, the Mediterranean. So yes, it's very important, the question of who controls the uh, uh, southern uh, coast of uh, the Mediterranean, which is also the southern flank of NATO, is important. And therefore, uh, what the United States would like to do, uh, by the way, having first uh, complimented Haftar for uh, fighting ISIS and um, um, Akim, uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, in that uh, region. Um, after doing that, one may see 
two uh, parallel movements. One is to find some agreement with the Russians in order to settle the Libyan conflict. And another one could be the division of Libya into old time Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, um, west and east, around Tripoli and around um, uh, Benghazi or Silt and um, uh, cities and towns in between. Now, Libya is not a big country population-wise. Um, of course, uh, its size is uh, two and a half times the size of Texas. It's very big. It's almost two million square kilometers. But its population is less than Israel's. There are less than eight million Libyans, a very sparsely populated uh, country. So um, if it was not for the oil, uh, which is not uh, equally distributed around the country, one would probably have found Haftar uh, taking over the eastern part and Saraj the western part. Dr. Cohen, it seems to me that everybody except for Turkey is supporting Haftar, even though the United States is not very clear about who it's supporting in this situation. Now, there's been some reports about uh, different disengagements of U.S. forces, including from the uh, uh, crucial Uh, presence of American forces in the Sinai Peninsula, where they have been uh, monitoring the peace between Israel and Egypt. Now, to what degree do you see uh, the Americans uh, either redeploying their sixth fleet somewhere else uh, or uh, pulling it out altogether, considering the isolationist uh, policies of President Trump and the interests Uh, of the Americans right now to focus domestically, specifically on the situation vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19? And to what degree do you see a potential withdrawal from the region uh, create some kind of conflict between Saraj and Turkey and other major actors in this region? Uh, Saraj uh, was very happy to support of Turkey, so he doesn't have many active supporters. I don't see that he is uh, so easily uh, giving up this support. But I think that taking into consideration that the U.S. and some other superpowers are caring about the stability of that area, that region, not only the Mediterranean, but all the way down to the Suez Canal, to the Indian Ocean, which means uh, this side of Africa and the other side of the Gulf, uh, it's extremely important to them to try to preserve at least some kind of stability in the region in order to enable some other parts of it to function at least uh, basically. So it's to leave uh, the Sixth Fleet or to move uh, the, river, uh, the MFO uh, to uh, create a new jobs in uh, Libya, that will be a little bit uh, far away thinking. I think that uh, Egypt would like to push more uh, to help in its uh, uh, western border, which is a long border of 2,000 kilometers without a fence and penetration of terrorists from all kinds uh, to Egypt, uh, which is not easy, and that's a real concern of Egypt. But still, uh, ever since the Russian uh, joined Egypt uh, to support Haftar, I think they, they could somehow uh, work together, which serves also Russian interests, in order to prevent as much as they can Uh, shifting terrorism inside Egypt. The, old, the other side is the uh, uh, ISIS uh, and some Akim and others who moved freely basically from Libya, from Libya to Mali to the other side and back all the time without a real uh, block within Libya, within Western and, and East Libya. It creates a big headache to uh, most of the countries. So I think it's, it's too early to assume that uh, there will be a big move from, from the U.S. or from China or from, uh, in order 
able to change the situation uh, as well as Haftar easily. Uh, he attacked Tripoli and also he tries to, uh, to prove that he su- will succeed uh, to, uh, to show uh, his power within this equation. And he hints that nobody uh, we, without uh, Russia and Egypt and the Emirates can, uh, uh, can ignore him anymore. Uh, Dr. Lerman, your take on this? Well, first of all, uh, the situation politically has changed now that Haftar declared himself effectively the ruler of Libya, not just uh, a challenger or uh, trying to uh, create some kind of joint government. He is basically now um, playing for the full uh, uh, for the full deck of cards, uh, which makes compromise even more difficult. Um, the American position is fascinating because originally they had they instinctively supported the existing order and Saraj. And fighting ISIS, they relied on the Misratawi militia, which is the main fighting force of the DNA, of, of, the, uh, of the Saraj side now. But Trump very quickly shifted sides because essentially the interests of Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Italy, um, uh, uh, require a um, that Haftar, if not, uh, will, if, if he doesn't conquer Tripoli, will be able at least to set the terms in a way that uh, forces the Saraj government to abandon the Turkish map of the Eastern Mediterranean. Because otherwise we are facing a long period of instability in the Eastern Mediterranean with severe consequences. And while the Amer- there are um, isolationist instincts in Washington, there's also the competition with uh, China, with the PRC. And since the uh, Belt and Road Initiative marks out the Eastern Mediterranean as an important element of, the, uh, of, the Ch- of Chinese strategy, then the Americans, by definition, have their own interest there as well. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Oren, we're actually drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to have somewhat of a projection for the near future. Where are we heading to? And if you could also add uh, Jerusalem, Israel into the mix, considering the fact that Israel is impacted by this conflict. Well, as uh, Dr. Lerman Lerman, uh, uh, ticked off the uh, powers uh, for and against Saraj, uh, Israel uh, is uh, always or almost always on the side opposite Qatar, Turkey, Hamas, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Oh. Uh, and therefore Israel uh, is instinctively with Egypt and with Haftar, even though the Russians have their own reasons um, uh, to uh, back Assad in Syria and Haftar in Libya, which doesn't seem uh, consistent. but. Um, one problem that one sees is that the Americans are divided. Egypt is under the central command, Libya, as well as uh, sub saharan Africa and Tunisia and Algeria and all the rest are Africa, Africa. African command, Africa. and the Mediterranean is under UCOM, under the European command. And you have too many cooks uh, having uh, their hands there uh, in the plate. Uh, it could yeah. play against uh, a consistent campaign. Dr. Koren, shortly. Uh, we have to uh, take into consideration that we live with complexities. We're not always solving right away. So uh, we need to find a way how to maintain the situation to the point that together with the corona uh, implications and the uh, clearance of uh, the U.S. administration towards the elections, maybe the uh, policy in the Middle East uh, will be changed. In, in, in that area will be changed while we following carefully how the Russians, not all, all only dealing from the wrong reason with Libya, but also their very interesting uh, behavior in Syria recently. So we need to to follow up and very, very uh, carefully. Dr. Lerman? In two sentences, Israel's main interest is to ensure that the United States brings leverage to bear on Erdogan on this and other aspects of his Eastern Mediterranean policy. 
with the with the Russians already committed uh, to checking the spread of uh, of neo Ottomanism. I think uh, the American position can be decisive, and Israel's role should be in conversation with both sides of the aisle in Washington on this question. Indeed, Mr. Olin, one, last sentence. One additional common interest for Egypt and Israel that the arms uh, which have been left in uh, Libya from the Gaddafi era not get into Sinai for the ISIS uh, group there and uh, into Gaza for Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. A big issue that has been, uh, of course, uh, uh, challenging also the the... Cairo government and authorities there, but this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Chaim Koren for being here with us today, uh, or okay. in central Israel with us. Uh, also, Dr. Eran Lerman, thank you so very much. Mr. Amir Oren, thank it's you. always a pleasure. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we'll see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.